the hundred, it's a hundred and fifty seven square feet smaller than the garden you took. All right. So so we do that. It's okay. We may uh well, let's try that. She had one. Uh and you want that was the last one. Uh they they it's finished, but I don't like it. Um they put the cheap carpet in the living room. So I said I would have to have the blanket. Uh, and you know, all that just gotta figure in this and kind of that way. You know, they play numbers to their advantage naturally. So uh, there's a couple things and you come into play a lot because I would have to get you to get the vendor that you got for your mother but I'll need that vintage that you can borrow in the kitchen because that's a spot for it. Um I don't I don't remember what you said she, uh, the plan she had, but I'll need you to help me with that. I couldn't have a kitchen. Yeah, I uh, I just used whoever they they were using at the time. Okay. I don't have a guy that would. Okay. I can't so, think of a guy that would do that for me. Did you have to pay for it? Yeah, it was cheap. Okay. I mean, you pay their rate. Oh, that's what I said. I knew you paid something, but I didn't know. All right, so um, that that has Welcome, welcome, welcome in everyone. Welcome to CARE Concierge with CARE Patrol, where education is the heart of everything that we do. Uh, today's topic is Medicare for all. And that may be familiar to some of you if you think back to the last presidential election and cycle Medicare for all was a topic that was very much in the news and remains in the news. And it was interesting enough to me uh, to feel that it might be worth learning more and sharing what I've learned with you. So I hope you enjoy your time with us today. Uh, if you're new to us and you're not familiar with who we are, uh, Care Patrol is an aging care navigation firm. Uh, and some people will refer to us as senior placement or other services. But what we do is hold the hands of families who are in crisis or in planning stages around senior care, whether that be sitters or nursing homes or assisted livings or home health agencies or hospices or elder care attorneys. We have a network of folks who we refer and those communities to who we refer pay our fees, sort of like a realtor. So we drive our clients around like a realtor would and look at properties of interest. And all of this we do at no charge to the family or potential resident or patient. Instead, if we move someone in or someone uses a service we recommend, so long as they're not a Medicare service, uh, then we're paid a fee. And that's how we exist. And we exist on the kindness and, and graciousness of people like you who believe in us, who trust us, who refer us, and we are most grateful. Uh, we are accredited, for those of you who are new, uh, by the Alabama Boards of Nursing and also of Social Work, and each of those boards approves this uh, class as a 1.0 hour CEU. Um, in order to receive credit for being here today, you must complete our evaluation. It's online and it's password protected. Uh, and the way that, and the reason that we do this and password protect the evaluation is so that the Alabama Board of Social Work will consider this a live and not a recorded CEU. Live and that you can discuss, chat, ask questions, compare your notes to your peers, and hopefully gain a little extra knowledge. That's our goal. Our goal, in fact, with everyone is to educate them so that they can make the best decisions for themselves moving forward. Now, we do encourage discussion. I very much depend on it. Thank you, Ms. Wright, for putting the uh, 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 link in the chat for those of you that are looking for it. Uh, and we uh, give out the evaluation password at the end of today, but I'll give out the link to you now so that those of you who are participating by phone or not able to read the screen, see the screen, our evaluation link for today's class, Medicare for All, is at https colon forward slash forward slash 
www.surveymonkey.com forward slash lowercase r forward slash means are all uppercase letters d is in dog f as in florida l c as in cat b as in betty m as in mary and t as in tom now these evaluation links are always the same up until the last seven digits or letters and those are for today d as in dog f as in florida l c as in cat b as in betty m as in mary t as in tom We'll upload the nursing hours for this course for the nurses onto the ABN website within the week. Everyone will receive a certificate of participation within 24 hours or so. We do ask that you try and complete this evaluation by eight o'clock today, and that will allow me in the morning then to send out your certificates. If you have needs for education or advocacy for a senior or someone else, in the Tennessee Valley, Dixie Tyler's email and phone is on the screen. Janet Pearson serves us in Montgomery and Auburn. Her number and email is on the screen. And C.W. Mary is our chief clinical officer and serves Birmingham and, and really all of our territories as needed. Uh, and we appreciate, again, and depend upon your referrals. Our objectives for Medicare for All are fairly simple. We want to compare the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, sometimes known uh, as Obamacare. We want to compare Obamacare to Medicare for All. Are they the same? Are they similar? Are they different? We want to list then, if Medicare for All were instituted, who would be covered by Medicare for All and what would be covered by Medicare for All? We want you to be able to repeat at least two pros and two cons for Medicare for all. Those are the objectives today and they will be on the evaluation. And we do ask that you, you know, provide candid comments so that we can improve. And we also really depend upon your suggestions for new topics. So I hope you'll give that a look on the evaluation at the end of today. So let's just ask you, and I'd like to get some chat started if we can. And remember, with, with these courses, I feel, we feel that, that my voice and the education presented here is, is enhanced and enriched and further developed by your opinion and your experience and your thoughts. And I hope you'll share them with us. Is Medicare, is Medicare for all anything like Obamacare? I'm guessing that's a question no one can answer. Um, and so let's get into it. The Affordable Care Act, which at times was derisively known as Obamacare, but I think that has sort of passed, has been an overwhelming success. In fact, we've dropped our uninsured rate in the United States to about 8.3% of our population. And that's in large part because of the access to health care and insurance that Obamacare guaranteed. And so we would say that Obamacare has been successful, uh, I think, in many respects. But what we would say then is that uh, in, in proof of that, in, in 2023, another 16 million people signed up to receive care under the Affordable Care Act. That's a new record for the Affordable Care Act. It's the 13 percent increase over the year before. And it's up for the third year in a row. And that coincides very nicely with the change in administration. Um, so we are moving down from 33.2 million uninsured or 10%, 10 percent, 10.3 in 2019 to 8.3 and really lowered now that we're further into 2023. What changes in addition to the ACA that, that the Biden administration made were that they extended uh, coverage through the American Rescue Plan. They uh, then further extended that with another, another, excuse me, COVID relief bill passed in March of 2021. And then that was extended even further with the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022. The Affordable Care Act would be replaced 
by Medicare for all. And the funding would come from some similar sources as we currently see with that. Um, according to the Kaiser Family Foundation, the provisions that the Biden administration made to the Affordable Care Act included allowing subsidies for insurance for applicants earning 400% or more of the federal poverty level. And with those uh, subsidies, then obviously the price came down and that ACA coverage then became even more attractive. And Mrs. Uh, Clardy had commented with us, why do I know, what I do know, excuse me, is that there's often a gap in the ACA for people who are younger without children. When I was in college and not working, I looked at the ACA marketplace website and the cheapest option for me was still like 3000 a year. Now this would have changed, I believe Ms. Clardy uh, in the last year, but you might be interesting to take a look again. I know that, that we provide insurance and one of the things that we looked at was the Affordable Care Act. We were able actually to get a better policy for less from Blue Cross, if you can believe it. So let's give an example then of how that change might affect you, Ms. Clardy, or anyone else. If you were 60 and not probably 26, uh, and you were just over the poverty level of around 52,000 a year, now that's 400% of the poverty level, you understand, four times the poverty level. Uh, but if your income is there, uh, your bill for affordable care for the Obamacare would still have been around $950, which is about 22% of your income. And that's one fifth of what you make for health insurance, something you may not use or need. So after this change, the premium was capped at 8.5%, you know, less than half of prior, and it would establish then a payment of about $370. So really roughly a third or two thirds, 60% less. And the same laws that were enacted with the uh, Obamacare Act also extended Medicare eligibility to new groups. And so now in 2020, we're covering 90% of Americans or 92, I guess, and, and what we see then, though, honestly, is that this is actually driven by a rise in private insurance, not public insurance. Why might that be, do y'all suppose? Well, could it be that if you were to log into Medicare.gov right now, that that front page, home page, would be very little more, it seems to me, than an advertise, advertisement for Medicare Advantage plans, which are different from Medicare and different from Obamacare and different from Medicare for all. And so the rise in these, and this now, I think in those of you who are working in billing will know percent of your Medicare Advantage clients over Medicare clients has climbed precipitously since the really Trump and Bush administrations. Um, so Medicare for all then, just to be clear, is not about Medicare really. And it's not about the Affordable Care Act. What it's really about is establishing a single payer healthcare system like we see in most of the developed world. So who then, I'll ask y'all, would Medicare for all cover? Would it cover Miss Clardy, a young college student? Uh, would it cover me, a 56-year-old man? Would it cover you? Who would Medicare for all cover? And I expect you are sort of realizing at this moment, but that's a bit of a trick question because Medicare for all will cover every American citizen, everyone. You're all right. You're all right. It was an easy question. Medicare for all will cover all of us and legal residents as well. Uh, Medicare itself currently covers about 65 million beneficiaries and Medicaid covers another 70 million, you know, 12 million of the 82 that are Medicaid Recipients also receive Medicare, they're dual eligible. And then the Children's Health Insurance Program, which has cuts facing, by the way, CHIP, covers just over 7 million. So altogether, now, we have a single payer system installed, essentially, for 141 million people, which is about a third of our population as of today. Medicare for all would 
essentially double our uh, our our loyalty, our allegiance, and our burden to establish Medicare for all. Medicare, y'all know, I'm preaching to people who are probably much more well versed in Medicare than I. But you know, it's government funded. We all know that, and we know that it's not only for people who are are aging or over 62 or 65 or 67 or whenever you sign up for Social Security, but but uh, we know that it also covers folks who have certain disabilities. Now, Medicare for All would expand this. It would ensure every American and legal U.S. resident, and it would cover a more comprehensive set of health care services than is currently afforded under Medicare and even private insurance. So we've been hearing about this, as I said at the beginning of the hour, since the 2022 president or 2020 presidential campaign, excuse me, I've lost track of time. We, we probably associate the terminology of Medicare for all with Bernie Sanders, who was a Democratic uh, nominee, or, or Elizabeth Warren, who was also a Democratic nominee. Uh, but there have been numerous bills that mimic this Medicare for all uh, introduced in Congress, in the U.S. Congress, since 20, uh, excuse me, 2003, uh, Medicare for all, uh, as there are some variations of it, there were nine proposals in 2019 and another in 2021. So Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren were not the end of this discussion. Now, the things that, that Medicare currently covers, uh, to illustrate the difference, would be, and you know this, Part A covers our hospice and inpatient hospital services and home health services, and Part B covers outpatient and preventive services. Medicare C, or Medicare Advantage, was popularized uh, in the last few years following on the heels of Part D, which was a Bush administration, Bush 43 administration uh, initiative that was to cover the cost of prescription drugs. Medicare Part C is Medicare Advantage, and we have a CEU on this. If you'd like to look at it on YouTube, you can view it there, take the evaluation and receive credit for a recorded CEU. But Medicare Advantage essentially takes the pot of money that would go to you as a Medicare a, a recipient based on certain data and put that pot of money into the hand of the private insurer, the Medicare Advantage plan every month. And so the way the Medicare Advantage plan makes money is to deny those services. So if they get $11,000 for you, they want to deny, 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 so they can increase their profit margin. This was not really the intention of Medicare. And then those who elect and properly and, and rightly and correctly elect to not choose Medicare Advantage plans, but instead choose A, B, find a D plan, and then supplement those copays and other costs with Medicare supplement insurance, often called Medigap, and Medicare for all would then cover everything that current Medicare covers as listed here. Now, everyone would have comprehensive insurance and universal coverage without financial hardship. Pre-existing medical conditions would not have any impact on someone's ability to be covered under Medicare for all. And this was first initiated and installed by the Affordable Care Act, which eliminated many conditions, but not all the conditions that Medicare for all seeks to address. Coverages under Medicare for all would include inpatient and outpatient services, so A and B parts of Medicare, mental health, which we currently do not have coverage, they even lack very good coverage in most private insurance plans, reproductive and maternity care, which may be available under some Medicaid, uh, to some Medicaid recipients, but generally is not available uh, to obviously Medicare recipients, uh, although private insurance certainly handles this. Prescription drugs, which is currently covered by Part D, dental, hearing, and vision services, and these are the hooks that Medicare Advantage plans use to re re bring people in is, well, we're gonna pay for vision and, and hearing and vision. And you know, if you've ever had a, a family member buy hearing aids, these are quite expensive. And so that's an attractive thing to folks, but what they don't realize with Medicare Advantage is that they're not going to get other services 
or the extent of services that Medicare might cover. And those of you who work in rehab will know that inpatient rehab will understand that under Medicare, if you have a three midnight stay in a hospital, you have up to 20 days uh, of care at no copay in, in a rehab. Medicare Advantage plans are typically limiting people to less than 20 days, sometimes seven, 10. Uh, and so obviously the, those days that are left form their profit. Um, now, everyone would have comprehensive insurance, pre-existing conditions would be covered, and the coverage would include, in addition, home and community-based long-term care. And I would tell you, if you're sitting from my seat working in long-term care, that this might be the, the greatest benefit of all, because while our current generation of the elderly, those of the silent generation, which just followed the war, and even those of the boomer generation, do not have the kind of funds set aside to cover the cost of assisted living, for example, which in Alabama now is over $4,000 a month. Memory care can be over eight. Skilled nursing can be over $10,000 a month. How are we going to address this? We cannot financially keep raising prices in assisted living for a generation and two generations, my generation behind them, Generation X, who cannot afford a $6,000 a month rent payment. So to me, that in and of itself may be the best provision of Medicare for all. The National Library of Medicine estimated that a single payer system such as proposed here with universal coverage could save over $450 billion annually. So I have to ask you, then, would, would Medicare for all eliminate private insurance totally? Would Medicare for all eliminate private insurance? What do y'all think? Well, after the transition to single payer healthcare, private insurance companies and employer-based insurance wouldn't be allowed to offer those same set of services, benefits covered by Medicare for all. Now, they would still be able to sell supplemental policies. And you're right about that, Mrs. O'Dell. Uh, the private companies would be allowed to sell or give employees coverage that benefits, uh, that for benefits that Medicare for all would not cover. And that might be if you elected to choose a concierge care physician who would be at your beck and call. They typically run about $3,500 a year. And then all of your labs and other things are built through private insurance. You're paying really for access to the physician. Now, they also would cover things, private insurance in the future under Medicare for all would cover elective surgeries or cosmetic surgeries that would not be covered under Medicare for all. But it would be uh, obviously a, a significant change to the private insurance uh, agencies and, and companies. Now, under single payer health care, just to be clear, there's one entity, one single payer, in this case it would be the federal government, and they collect all of the fees for health care that are submitted by the providers and they pay all of the health care. Um, it does not mean that the government would in any way own or operate the health care providing entities, which may be a little different than what we see in, for example, the EU where they have single payer coverage. The, and the goal of single payer coverage is, is really this. If we put everybody into the pool and everybody then is in the same position, they're in the pool, they're in the same pool of risk. And if we have, what did I say, 141 million people now to give us negotiating power with our providers, we would have 335 million people in that pool. And that's how insurance functions. They demand in insurance, the, the way they profit is by the healthy people, right? They pay more for the ill than they do for the well. And therefore, the well are really putting out expenditures that are paying for other people. And that's how insurance works, regardless of whether it's Medicare for all or Blue Cross. Now, insurance providers, however, will only pay if you have services, right? 
Um, and so the fitter people then are not seeking services and there'd be no payment. So would Medicare for all allow patients to keep the same providers? That would be a, a pretty major question. Anyone who's changed insurance in, in their career and life knows that there are providers that they once attended that they can no longer see under their new insurance plan. And so Ms. Jarnigan and Ms. O'Dell, you nailed it. Is Medicare for all allow patients to keep the same providers? And yes, they do. In fact, 98% of providers in the United States already participate in Medicare. And if they do, then they would be uh, similarly uh, well schooled and, and have processes in place and other things that would mean that they would sort of automatically be granted Medicare for all provider status. Now, you know that there would be certain national minimum standards, but there already are. It would be the quality of facilities, the staffing, the training, and the outcomes. And this is exactly what you would expect to see if you went to Medicare.gov to, for example, compare nursing homes. You would do find a provider, put in your zip code, and then search for, for example, nursing homes around you. And you could drill down into their five-star ratings, one to five, and see specifically how they scored in quality and staffing and outcomes. And so this is not new and providers already meet these standards. And we would be able to switch providers under Medicare for all. There would be no such thing as in-network and out-of-network uh, for 98% of the providers, let's say. And, and, and you could receive services from any of them. So then if you can see anyone you want, what is going to be the effect on your wallet? Would Medicare for all have out-of-pocket cost? Would there be copays and deductibles and other things under Medicare for all? Would Medicare for all have out-of-pocket cost? Medicare for all would eliminate all out-of-pocket costs, all co-pays, all co-insurance, and all deductibles for almost all services. The one exception would be prescription drugs. But the Medicare for all plans, thank you, Ms. Fraser, for saying yes. Uh, the Medicare uh, for all plans have provisions within them that enable the Secretary of Health and Human Services, which is a cabinet-level presidential position appointed, would have the option to establish limited out-of-pocket costs for prescription drugs. In fact, what they propose is that the Secretary of Health would set a maximum annual out-of-pocket amount to $200 annually. I mean, no out-of-pocket cost for preventive drugs or for people who have an income below a certain level. So think about the price of, for example, insulin going down. Coverage would be free, okay? There'd be no premiums, no deductibles, no co-payments, no co-insurance, and this is from berniesanders.com. In 2020, the healthcare spending per person in the United States was 11,945. Now that's an average, remember, that's averaged over someone receiving really no care to someone having a very serious uh, critical hospitalized event. Those who have a high deductible health plan today uh, would have deductibles of at least $1,400 per uh, annually. And, and then the higher cost, what we have all sort of know, and you know more than others, because you're in health care, that part of the high cost are high prices and administrative inefficiencies, which Medicare for All would seek to limit um, the single payer would improve the efficiencies by converting the public programs into one financing system, and there would be no need to deal with multiple payers, and that would streamline the billing for each of you as providers and reduce your overhead. Uh, and now individuals would not have to worry about shopping around for physicians within network, because again, 
98% or more of our current provider base would be uh, already essentially granted this Medicare for all provider status. So that begs the question then, how would Medicare for all be funded? And I would say that this is a million dollar question uh, in, the, in the vernacular, but the truth of this question is, it's about a $10 trillion funding. Now, trillion, just to be clear, is 1,000 million. Okay, that's a lot of people, and that's a lot of money. So how would Medicare for all be funded? I see no one's bitten on that question, but we all know. Um, it would include our payroll taxes, income taxes, uh, benefits on trust funds, investments. Uh, these currently cover the hospital insurance trust fund, which covers most Part A hospital services, benefits. Premiums paid for Part B medical insurance and Part D, along with funds authorized by Congress, pay Part B and Part D benefits currently. Medicare Advantage plans, Part C, come from Part A and Part B accounts. Medicare pays, as I said earlier, a fixed amount each month to the private insurers who initiate and offer Medicare Advantage plans. Um, and that is, again, you know, that, that's the amount Medicare is going to spend blank. They can either spend it all on you, or they can spend it partially with Medicare Advantage and partially on you. And Medicare supplement plans, which again are private insurance as well, Medigap policies, receive no federal funding. So the healthcare providers would then receive these payments from, from the federal government uh, for original Medicare beneficiaries and from Medicare Advantage plans for members of their uh, uh, benefit plan. Cindy McKenzie says, we can't afford it. We can't afford what we have now, very true. Especially if we continue to cut it like is being proposed uh, with the uh, current uh, debt limit talks. Now, if you wanna find more about Medicare funding and cost, you can visit medicare.gov, which I use all the time, forward slash basics, forward slash cost. The 2022 monthly premium for Part B was $170.10 a month. Medicare for all, remember, would cover A, B, C, D, well, not D, C, but D, uh, and it would do so with a maximum $200 out-of-pocket cost. Those who have not earned enough Social Security credits might pay another as much as $499 annually. Part D and Medigap policies also have monthly premiums. These, of course, range depending on the coverage. And then the higher income beneficiaries who are subject to income-related monthly adjustments can pay $180 to $486 per month more for Part B and Part D. Medicare Advantage plans' maximum out-of-pocket limit is $8,300 in 2023. And if you are nearing that age, please be aware that if you, for example, enrolled in Medicare Advantage and were on it for a year or two, long enough to realize that it wasn't what you needed, and you then wanted to change back to original Medicare and get a Part D plan as a, as a supplement, maybe a Medigap plan, there'd be penalties. So if you enroll late, you actually get less over the life of, of that benefit than you would if you enrolled originally in Medicare. <clears throat> the cost estimates for Medicare for all will obviously vary depending on which side of the fence you find yourself on. But the Congressional Budget Office in 2019 projected that federal subsidies for health care would be 1.5 trillion to 3 trillion higher in 2030, seven years from now, uh, than under the single player options than under current law. So it would cost 3 trillion, excuse me, dollars more 
for our healthcare system uh, than it would be to continue the current system. And this is from other you know, reports, Medicare for all under Bernie Sanders, according to Luthra, would cost between 30 trillion and 40 trillion dollars over a 10 year span. Now the study by the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget said paying Medicare for all could require raising payroll taxes, you and me, by 32%. And the question would be, would that 32% equal be greater than or less than what we currently pay and then pay in addition for insurance coverage? <clears throat> so other proposals to fund Medicare for all would be a 25% income surtax, a 42% value added tax on consumption, so otherwise we're being taxed twice, as we currently are, <laughs> and then a 100% increase, they suggest, an individual and corporate tax rate. Now that sort of flies in the face of the previous paragraph, but that's pretty substantial. And more than likely, uh, this would be a combination of all of the above and more. Well, we have those in the nation who are for Medicare for all, and we have those who are against Medicare for all. And is there any sort of central common thread running through their arguments? Do they have the same theme in how they make their argument? Are they coming from the same point of view? What is the common theme quoted by those who are for and by those who are against Medicare for all? Healthcare is a human right, Ms. Odell says, and it is right here on the screen. Healthcare is a right. Supporters and opponents of Medicare for all both say the same thing, that Americans should have access to quality and affordable health care. The supporters would say Medicare for all be the most effective way to ensure this goal and that it would drive efficiencies in service that would sort of curtail some of the cost. Opponents argue that it would reduce the quality of health care if we move to Medicare for all, and that it would place an additional and significant burden on us as taxpayers. And if, like me, you may see both sides of the argument, and that's okay. <laughs> Excuse me. What are the pros and cons, then, of Medicare for all? What are the pros of Medicare for all? And what are the cons of Medicare for all as you see them? What are your thoughts? What are the pros of Medicare for all? Ms. Odell would say it's a definite pro. Healthcare is a human right. Some of you might say, well, no, I, I, you know, I, I'm listening to the data and the numbers and I'm wondering how we're gonna make this work. So what are the pros and cons? Well, universal coverage is clearly a pro, isn't it? It certainly meets the, the theme of uh, everyone having access to health care. And it is obviously going to lower out-of-pocket costs from 11000 annually under Medicare or 8300 under Medicare Advantage to about $200 or slightly higher annually. And there would be no provider networks. And this would be a big uh, benefit for each of us as consumers of health care, as patients. Now, there are others who say that uh, and in fact, the Pew Research Center did a poll and found out that 60% of us as Americans believe the federal government's responsibility is to make sure that all Americans have health care. Medicare for all would automatically enroll all U.S. citizens in health care at birth. And this would increase insurance coverage by 28.3 million people, nearly everyone left who doesn't have insurance. This is from the Urban Institute. And Medicare for All would cover virtually all of the services that Medicare covers, including, or in addition, not included in Medicare, preventive services, mental health services, 
dental and vision care, and medical devices, again, with no out-of-pocket expenses. And even if you switch jobs, you maintain your coverage. Now, I know that each of us has probably had more than one job, and we've seen our insurance coverage bounce around depending on what the employer chose for us. Medicare for all people who are, are pro-Medicare for all insist that, that universal health care would lower health care costs because the government would control costs through this in, you know, greater buying power. They suggest that there'd be less administrative costs for the provider because you would not be working with multiple health insurers trying to go between plans and understand coverages and get codes right. You'd only deal with one agency and that would simplify coding for sure. And it would save companies money because they would not be paying these billing fees that they pay to third party uh, billers. And the coverage rules would be standardized. So you wouldn't have to sit at your desk and remember how does Blue Cross address this issue as compared to United or Humana or Aetna or Viva or whomever else. Um, and then that would then provide what we think, at least in theory, would be the same health care that we currently receive, but at a lower cost. Um, and then we believe that with increased utilization, we would see a healthier population because of preventive care. In fact, it would, we believe, lower emergency room uses. In fact, before Obamacare, 40% or 46% of ER patients simply had nowhere else to go. Were uninsured, they didn't have a primary care or other specialty physician. They had nowhere to go but the emergency room. And with the rise then in the number of, un, or the number of insured rather, we've already begun to see this number go down. In 2009, now I know this is a little old data, but in 2009, it was estimated that one third, 33% of healthcare costs were wasted essentially and did not improve our health. This is according to the New England Journal of Medicine. And with the single payer system, the cost of care, the pro uh, belief is that it would be reduced. Cost of care by 10%, at least based on these lower administrative costs and with the economies of scale of the government in terms of negotiating power. And they also believe that drug prices will decrease as the government would have the power to negotiate those prices and that would leave negotiations to one entity versus multiples. Ms. O'Dell says pro, it actually costs the taxpayer even less when you look at all the other unintended consequences of not having health care. For example, loss of wages, employee time, et cetera. And Ms. Wright says it would definitely be a lot simpler. I'm sorry, I'm having a little difficulty. So, the pro then with Medicare for all, you, you can see any doctor who's opted in. You would no longer worry about in or out of network cost or providers. And this currently makes up 18% of hospital admissions, by the way, according to the Kaiser Family Foundation. And the intention of Medicare for all would be to allow post patients to focus on their health and not on understanding the, the complicated nature of coverage of the current healthcare system. The cons would be, again, it depends on who you ask as to what the numbers are, but the cons would be that it's estimated by Mercatus to be a $32 trillion expense over 10 years. And they say that even if we doubled corporate and income tax, 100%, in other words, it would not cover the cost. There would still be a shortfall the benefits of Medicare for all are far more extensive than anything offered on the national health care plan or Medicare marketplace. And there are those such as those at the Cato Institute who suggest that if we had full access to health care, that we might overuse it and that cost would balloon because of that unanticipated and unprojected cost. And of course, the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget says that taxing the rich and corporations and the financial sector could cover only about a third of the total cost of the program. 
and taxes on all Americans would then be necessary, including the middle and working class and small business. All of these would be required to pay for this $32 trillion program. Now, and what they say, and of course this is true in anything, isn't it? That the savings might not be as advertised. And all these projections may really be woefully short uh, and, and unintended, such as Medicare Advantage plans faced when they first came out and long-term care insurance plans faced even before that. Uh, the savings might not be as advertised and it may not drive down the cost using this single payer bargaining power. Again, they say the Kaiser Family Foundation says that no other developed nation has zero out of pocket cost. And yet we're essentially suggesting that for Medicare for all, people may be careless knowing that they have the right to health care if they have an injury or get sick. And they believe that uh, there be less incentive for providers and doctors that to keep costs down, that salaries might have to be run down as well. Uh, and that having less qualified or less numbers in general of people entering the healthcare field will be a less incentive then to receive or less ability to receive uh, quality healthcare. And then it would also, we think, affect our funding dollars for research and technology to combat many chronic and other diseases. And I think we all know sort of intuitively that wait times for services would increase, not only the physical wait time in a waiting room, but the wait time to get an appointment to be in the waiting room. And it, under a single payer system, there would be no, uh, you know, no competition such that the government could, after it's installed, then remove some of the services promised like uh, preventive care, for example or things that have a low probability of success. So say you're 82 and you need a hip, you're probably not getting a hip in France, but you are in the United States because we have a private insurance plan. But there they say you're 82, you can live with your hip, it's not imperative. If you were 22, it'd be different. So there may be the potentiality for less coverage. And Ms. McKenzie, you had already, you had already uh, let everyone know our last point when you said, or the government may decide to quit covering the more expensive services. Very intuitive, Ms. McKenzie. So continuing on with the kinds of Medicare for all, we can look at Canada just to the north and see that with they have a publicly funded healthcare system and the median wait time to see a specialist and this is for medically necessary treatment, understand, was over 4.5 months to get the appointment, 113% increase from 1993. So even if we say that we're going to, uh, you know, not have the wait time issue that we have uh, anticipated in the beginning, that doesn't mean that it may not balloon into such. And it is estimated that providers under federally funded health care could make as 40% as less than what they currently make under private insurance. I think that's a stretch because private insurance does not really cover a lot of services. But it, additionally, they say that with increasing health care access, then we would increase the amount or need for these services while decreasing the amount paid for those. And that, I think, we can all agree, could impact the quality of the health care that we receive. This is from the Mercatus Center again. And then lowering health care workers' wages might incentivize you all and others to avoid the field. And in reducing pharmacy cost, we may then also reduce the research cost. Now, this is something I think we could pass on to other countries because the majority of, of medical research takes place really in America because of the way that we fund our pharmaceutical companies and then it's passed on to others. And I think there's a, perhaps a, an ability there to, to maybe not necessarily suppress research. Ms. Smith is, says that she feels like it's a dangerous idea for many of the reasons listed by my peers here 
And Ms. Thomas says maybe doctors could spend more time with patients with Medicare for all, allowing better quality care. And that very well may be true, Ms. Thomas, except that if you do, it really anticipate an 11% increase and you're already seeing a, a, quite a load of patients daily, can you really sustain that? Um, now, the cons for Medicare for All might be summed or begin to sum by, by this. 91% of us have health care insurance now, 91%. Under Medicare for All, that would be 100% or very near, and they would be kicked off their current plan and re-enrolled in a new government plan. Now, anyone that's changed insurance knows that can be burdensome. And research from a Gallup poll shows that seven in 10 of folks who are covered by their employer's plan are happy with it. And they would have no ability to have that same plan if Medicare for all were instituted because private insurance would be in effect, eliminated. And so we see then that as sometimes things can be in life, perhaps Medicare for all is too good to be true. Um, now, I'm not sure this is a necessarily a con for us, but in 2020, the health insurance industry had $31 billion in net earnings. That's $31 billion in profit. And it's probably made in some part by denying coverages. And that's an increase from the year before by almost 4%. And what they're suggesting then by, by raising this issue is that if we eliminate all of these plans, we eliminate the jobs of 600,000 people, all these insurance employees. And there would be duplication of services among them. So you'd have quite a few people out of work who could not gain work with the federal government to do the same job. And so in summation now, the high healthcare utilization could be really problematic, could increase our demand for services and wait times and competition for appointments. The tax changes would be incredible. Uh, payroll, wealth, uh, you know, uh, consumption, other taxes would, would be uh, raised. And even then, if we were to receive health care at no cost, would they be offset those costs, particularly if we're young and healthy, uh, by the cost of health insurance? And then, and here's the big one. How do we do it? It's an uncertain transition. It'd be huge, major, and it would affect not only the health care industry, but our economy. Think about 600,000 people being released in the job market. Oops. So then it's time to ask what obstacles stand in the way then of implementing Medicare for all? What obstacles would there be beyond the obvious? And maybe there's not any beyond the obvious. The obstacles would be that we're replacing literally thousands of insurance options with one. And so today we're on this and tomorrow we're on something totally new. And it would involve changes throughout the healthcare system in coverage, in provider payments and systems, in financing healthcare federally. And we'd have to have some sort of education around patient behavior and expectations under the new rule. And it would mean new systems for enrollment, claims, submission, payments, coverages, appeals, education. That's quite a chew. That's quite a big bite to uh, to launch into uh, from tomorrow or today to tomorrow. And there are opposition by the big players. You can clearly understand that the insurance and healthcare industries have aligned and formed PACs and uh, are lobbying the federal government to keep the current system. In fact. Uh, and this is a, a large number, there are 3,834 plans in the Advantage industry, and that's 284 more than last year. So these are growing again. That's, that's, the, that's the growth in the private insurance rate. The Partnership for America's Healthcare Future, which is an alliance of hospital health insurance and pharmaceutical lobbyists, spent over $140 million in 2018. That's probably doubled by now. Uh, 
Uh, and their goals include protecting patient choice, expanding access, lowering cost, improving quality, and fostering innovation. And I would bet they hit home most on that last point because the other goals are the same goals that are shared by Medicare for all proponents. The mission of the PAHCF Act is that whether it's called Medicare for all, Medicare buy-in, or the public option, one size fits all will never allow us to achieve the goals mentioned above. And the American Medical Association believes that the best way to expand healthcare is through a mix of private and public health insurance options, much like we see with Advantage plans. So this is a pretty potent opponents. Now, as I said at the beginning, lawmakers have introduced other Medicare expansion options that are more limited. This Senator Stabenow, Brown, and Baldwin introduced the Medicare at 50 Act in 2019, which would simply mean that we would lower the age of the ability to opt into Medicare from 64, or 65 rather, to between 50 and 64. Senators Bennett and Representative Higgins, these are all Democrats, which you probably noticed, introduced the Medicare X choice. And this would offer Medicare to people of any age through Obamacare marketplaces. And it would not be enacted nationwide. And I think this is smart. Instead, they would focus on adding Medicare options in places that had few providers or hospitals or for areas that only had one insurer. And that would be significant portions of the state of Alabama, which at one time was 86% of uh, the insured were on blue books in Alabama. Senator Schatz and uh, Representative Lujan, uh, and we quoted his, uh, his information earlier, proposed a bill called the State Public Option Act, which would allow people not to buy into Medicare, but instead to buy into Medicaid. Now, the issue with that, as we know in Alabama, is that different states administer Medicaid benefits differently. And while this might be a boon, for someone in a state like California, in a state like Alabama, uh, I think that we would be very limited in our capacity to offer this because we don't currently fund Medicaid as we should in the state already. But now everybody, I think, all of us on this call and everybody around us would agree that our present health care system is broken. People who need care in the United States are not getting it, and prices are higher than anywhere else in the world. So it's essential now that you, the healthcare practitioner, formulate for yourself your own ideas on what you feel about and how you feel about universal health care and how it fits into our system, and predict its pros and cons based on your own experience. It may lower market health costs, and it may improve care, and it may encourage more to preventative maintenance to avoid these ER visits that are costly and unnecessary, but you could end up paying more. And again, there are many in the, in the, in the arena who feel that this would be a burden on the healthcare system because people would more frequently utilize healthcare. And so, Let's see. Uh, Ms. Smith says, I feel like it's a dangerous idea. Oh, I've already read you, Ms. Smith. Uh, Ms. Smith said again, it's definitely so broken. I'm sorry, I got your quote right the last time. Thank you for commenting, Ms. Smith, and everyone who does or will comment. We appreciate you because we're going to ask you now, what is your opinion of Medicare for all? Are you for Medicare for all? or are you against Medicare for all? And if you are for or against, maybe list why. Um, Ms. Alexander, you're for it, thank you. What about the rest of you? Are you for Medicare for all? Are you against it? And if you're against it or if you're for it, do you have some personal reason or experience or belief that causes this? And this is where Ms. Alexander is for, and this is where I said in the beginning, your opinion, and your belief and your thoughts and your practice matter. They matter to me and they matter to your peers. And we'd love to hear from you when we ask these questions because they affect you. 
Miss Aaron says, honestly, I would have to sit down and weigh the pros and cons. I see both sides, but health care is definitely a human right. Ms. Wright says, I will always support universal health care, but I do feel there would be drawbacks that we would have to adjust, which could be difficult. Ms. Calder says, it's a tug of war. Ms. Baker says, I'm for giving people basic coverage, at least with the option to pay, opt in for more if needed. Good idea. Ms. Frazier, not sure if I really studied the pros and cons. And Ms. O'Dell, for as a cancer survivor, and I'm glad you're a survivor, and I, I'm glad that, it's, that you're here. For a cancer survivor, I had my diagnosis while being uninsured and thus delayed my initial care. That's scary. Delayed my care with a cancer diagnosis. Ms. Alexander says, all Americans need good health coverage. And Ms. Smith says, I'm against it as I understand it. Allowing others to control our health care is dangerous, in my opinion. I feel like it should be between patient and doctor. I agree, Ms. Smith, but I would say to you that it is not currently that either, that most of what we cover is driven by insurance coverages, whether or not they're medically sound or based or biased. Ms. Townsend says there are some pros and cons. I agree human needs should take precedence. Ms. Harris says, for there is no perfect solution but we can't continue to deny people basic health care. Ms. McKenzie, I'm against it, but I do support a mix of public and private. The government already struggles to manage and administer Medicare and Medicaid appropriately. I have serious concerns that they would be able to expand any program as well. Ms. Smith, for all, it benefits everyone in the long run. Well, I lost Ms. Smith. For all, it, benef it benefits many in the long run. Uh, although our other countries have had ups and downs with universal health care, all in all, it's improved the life expectancy. There are challenges with any system. It will take lots of advocacy, but it can work. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Ms. Talbert Four, I believe people won't be turned away from hospitals to receive proper treatment because they are un underinsured. And Ms. Thomas says, when I worked in a hospital, many of the doctors complained about what insurance would allow them to do or not. Medicare for all could make it more streamlined uh, and easier for doctors to offer options. I think more people would enter the medical field, thus hopefully decreasing the wait times. I will need to do more research, but I can see it being very beneficial overall. Thank you all for your wise comments. Thank you for sharing these with me and with others on the call. And I will say again, we most appreciate it. And uh, it is. Uh, Quite nice of you to, to do so. Our code word, as promised at the end of the hour, is USA, all caps, United States of America, USA. Everyone will receive a certificate within 24 hours. Please do the evaluation by eight today if you can. We'll upload the nursing hours to the ABN website for you. Social workers and nurses both receive certificates. And we always thank you for our referrals. I'm going to put in to the chat room uh, one more uh, uh, listing of the uh, of the uh, evaluation link, and I'm going to read it one more time for those of you that are not seeing a screen and may have missed it earlier. The evaluation link today is HTTPS, and that means it's secure, colon, forward slash, forward slash, www.surveymonkey.com forward slash lowercase r, forward slash all uppercase letters, D as in dog, F as in Florida, L, C as in cat, B as in Betty, M as in Mary, T as in Tom. That's the evaluation link. The code word is USA. Please join us Monday. We will uh, be substituting a talk planned by Dr. Cliff Arsenault uh, who could not attend with a ethics unit, which is working ethically with the elderly. I hope if you work in this field, you'll join us. I appreciate you joining today. And as always, I appreciate what you do and do every day in the service of other people. Monday is Memorial Day, but I am immune to holidays. So I will be doing a Zoom. If you're at home, you're bored, it's 12, join us. But certainly if you're at a picnic with your family, 
forget about us and enjoy your long weekend. Thank you all so much. I always appreciate your comments and your kind words and your attendance. Hope you have a great weekend and I'd love to see you Monday.